Welcome to the Paris Grand Slam. This stunning city is the host for the first tournament in the IJF's 2013 World Circuit. As always, the iconic Bercy Stadium will once again be packed to the rafters with avid judo fans. 2012 was the year of the Olympics, where for some the hard work paid off and a lucky few were granted a place in the history books. But now it's back to business as usual. Fighters and coaches eyeing up the coming World Championships, which this year come from Rio de Janeiro and promise to be bigger and better than ever before. And before that, there's the World Masters in Tumen, Siberia, for which IJF President Marius Visa signed the contracts in Paris with the world's media looking on. At the official draw, the President had lots to discuss with the delegates. As Paris marked the implementation of several changes to the rules of competition judo. But for the public in attendance, the weekend was all about welcoming home newly crowned Olympic champions Lucy Dicos and Teddy Renair. And with both in action at the Grand Slam, the bubbling cauldron of Bercy simmered with anticipation. But at under 60 kilograms, it's a Japanese fighter that's stirring things up. At just 19 years of age, Takato has won his last two Grand Slams and just before Christmas took gold on home soil in Tokyo with some stunning Ippon Judo. At this rate, he looks on track to claim a first world title in Rio. In Bercy, he was also looking good. If he took gold here, he would be up to world number one and he looked determined to make it happen. In the final, he would be up against another youngster, the Korean Jang. Could he stop Takato? Well, Takato's coming out wearing white and Takato is the new kid on the block at under 60 kilograms. And Jang is in blue. Takato can go left and right. And he's got a left, oh, beautiful Koji there, driving Jang over, not quite a score, but a great uh, variation in his technique to Kato, and he's growing with every match. He really is uh, establishing himself as a contender for the world title later this year. There's a left, oh, so to attempt there from Jang. Jang, looking for the same technique, oh, look at that! Brilliant stuff. Tewa's up and he just collapses him over and Jang could do nothing about it. That was brilliant stuff. Sumi Otoshi and, well, he just action reaction at its best. What else can you say about that? Because Jang fully committed himself, but he had it taken against him. And he is now the world number one, and he goes into Brazil as a favorite for the gold medal. The Japanese women were also on good form in Paris, taking gold to under 48, under 52, and over 78 kilograms. At under 48, it was Asami who came up trumps. A Wazari against home favourite Pei in the final was enough to seal the deal for double world champion. She stayed world number two, but is hot on the heels of number one, Menezes. Up one way to under 52 kilograms, it was Hashimoto who triumphed. She saw out a tactical final against the powerful Kelmende, frustrating the Kosovan fighter and forcing her to concede penalties. The win pushed her up to world number one. And finally, at over 78 kilograms, Takemoto took gold when she found herself on the right side of a disqualification to Olympic champion Ortiz. But in the final of the under 66 kilograms, there was domestic interest. Last year's defending champion La Rosse was in action. Frenchman had looked on blistering form on his way to the gold medal contest. But he'd be facing one of the most explosive fighters in the category. Mongolian danger man Davidorge. 
who had picked up a spectacular gold in Chindao at the end of last year and had picked up where he left off here in Paris. Could Davidoge stop La Ross? Well, La Ross looks very, very confident and pumped up, as he would in front of his home crowd, but Davidoge is the one that's uh, really establishing himself in this weight category. He's the new uh, king in this category at the moment, and he comes from different angles, and he's trying to get close to uh, La Ross. La Ross doesn't want any of it. Looking for the Ko Soto, hugging Ko Soto, but you've got to be gripped up now to do that. You can't just come in and grab and then throw. You've got to grip up first. Look at that. Beautiful as she was there from Davidoge. And it was, uh, well, La Ross that started it. Davidoge finished it. Still no score. Arm over. Looking for that arm over. But he can go left and right, Davidoge. Looking for the Taitoshi. Ouchi Gary Davidoz. Kouchi, and he's threatened with that a couple of times from the Ross. Ah, oh, and there it is. Got to be careful of that, Davidoz. He hooks on the inside, drives off the back leg from the Ross. And the crowd look on. Adoring fans, 15,000 of them in here. Davidoz now got the head. Now he's got the sleeve. This is what it's all about now. Grip up. And then the one that initiates the technique. So which one's it going to be? Kochi! Oh, it's La Ross! And the crowd go mad! La Ross says, what do you think about that? Second Paris tournament win for La Ross. And what a way to do it in front of his own crowd. And a small oh, well, smile, you could say, from Davidoy. And he made a mistake there. La Ross hooked in for the Kochi. He pulls the leg in, and he just drives. It's Uchimata, but the other way. And it's a brilliant technique. And in the final of Paris, and in front of his home crowd, and La Roche wins his second Paris tournament. The crowd sing the anthem. La Roche, well, a smile on his face. And it's every French fighter's dream to win here in Paris. And now, La Ross has done it twice. Moving up the male weights at under 73 kilograms, the Mongolian veteran Hashbatar found himself in the final. And he upset the odds on the way as he dramatically threw the latest Japanese sensation, Ono, with Uchimata in the semi-final. Up against him was the powerful young Brazilian, Mendonca. In the final, Mendonca took on an early lead, scoring Yuko with a low driving hip throw. Then Hashbatar attacked and was launched high into the air, but spun onto his front at the last second. No score. The Mongolian came forward, and again Mendonca exploded upwards, a long way down. But at the last moment, Hashbatar got his right foot down and was able to shift his balance in his favour. Wazari, enough to ensure it was the Mongolian flag flying highest in Paris. At under 81 kilograms, there was an equally spectacular moment in the final. And it came from Uzbek Imamov. Like Mendonka, he showed powerful hips to lift Georgian Chirikishvili up into the air. But as the Georgian stepped down, he was waiting and took the foot out from underneath him to score it. It was his first Grand Slam win and it moved him up to world number four. At under 90 kilograms, there was a change of world number ones. The young Georgian dynamo Lepatiliani completed his assault on the category when he overcame Gonzalez of Cuba in the final to reach the top spot. The score that did it for him was a trademark hip throw, for which he received a Yuko that would be enough to win him the final. Is he now ready to become world champion in Rio? 
At under 100 kilograms, it was another up-and-comer who stood on top of the podium. Czech Kapelik showed that judo isn't all about the throws, as he executed a textbook Jujikatami armbar on his Mongolian victim, Batuga, to force a submission. Like Lipatiliani before him, Kapelik also moved up to world number one. But the contest that really had the crowd going was for bronze, where Frenchman Marais also used groundwork to win by strangling Pasek of Sweden. Now Percy was really heating up. And there was more French interest at under 57 kilograms, as world number three Pavia fought off in the final against world number five, Yamamoto. The contest was a rematch from Tokyo in December, where it was Yamamoto who emerged victorious. Would Pavia get revenge in Paris? Well, Pavia has got to be very careful of the Ashiwaza and the Sodisura Kamigoshi of this young fighter from Japan. Yamamoto, new kid on the block. Nice Toronegi there from Yamamoto. Now Pavia has it all to do. She keeps drifting off to the edge, Pavia. She's got to be a little bit careful of that, but it's, uh, well, it's a Yuko there from Yamamoto. So now Pavia's got it all to do, and that means that she can't keep drifting off towards the edge. She'll be in for penalties if she's not careful. Yamamoto looking for the big Siragi. Oh, she's been countered. And a Yuko there to Pavia. A massive Sienagi attack there from uh, the young Japanese fighter, and it uh, was countered. They're looking for the Ashiwaza again. One Yuko, one penalty on the board each. Left to right, Pavia right. Ah, it's huge! And it's a Wazari. Old rules, that might have been an hip one, but it's a Wazari to Yamamoto. Always threatening there with that massive Sienagi there. Pavia, though, just avoids the Ippon. Pavia takes a look at the clock. The French crowd are behind Pavia. Now she starts again. Yamamoto looking for the Ippon. Oh, she's been taken back. And she made the biggest mistake of her life there. And Pavia jumped all over it. She was waiting for the big Sienagi again. It was on the edge again. But she got counter-attacked and driven backwards onto the point of her shoulders. Look at that. As she was there, Koso to get, And she just drives her backwards and puts her onto her back. This time, Yamamoto couldn't quite get the talk for the actual Sienagi technique. And she oh, made a mistake on the edge. Brilliant performance from Pavia, and she's now world number one. At under 63 kilograms, the French momentum continued as Agbek Nanu also took gold, climbing up to world number three in the process. She benefited from the new rule permitting ground attacks to continue outside the contest area. As she secured a hold on Van Emden of the Netherlands, she was in a position in which previously the referee would have stopped her. But she was allowed to continue the hold to score a hit and win the final. And at under 78 kilograms, Louette joined her amongst the French gold medalists when she also took gold in front of a rapturous Percy Stadium. Her final was against Ogata of Japan. It was decided by a dropping shoulder throw which landed the Japanese on her side to score a Yuko. And make every young French judoka's dream of winning in Bercy come true for Louette. And as the electric atmosphere in Bercy intensified, the stage was set for Dukos and Renair. At under 70 kilograms, Dukos was the first up of the two fighters who immortalised themselves in London. Rene has plenty of years left, but for Dukos, London was her last Olympics. And for the Bercy crowd, it was the last chance to see her in action on the legendary tatami after she'd announced that this would be her last ever Paris Grand Slam.
It marks the end of an era in which she has won this tournament seven times. She would be looking to go out on top. After a slow start in her opening contest, she eventually succeeded in throwing Bernabeu of Spain for Ipa. Then she came up against the young Dutch fighter Polly and looked to be struggling. With three minutes gone, she attacked. But it wasn't the usual to cut attack. The power wasn't there. And Polly countered. A rare sight. To Koss, thrown for Ippo. She would not be making it eight titles in her Paris swan song. The win galvanised Polling, who eventually won the tournament, beating Supanic of Canada in the final, with an Uchimata Wazari into a hold down. But only time will tell if her victory over the cost marked a changing of the guard under 70 kilograms. The cost, meanwhile, showed a glimpse of her usual self in the repercharge, using a beautiful foot sweep combination to throw her Tunisian opponent before clamping on a hold. She then outgunned her compatriot Pasquet in the bronze medal match to ensure that her last match in the theatre of French judo dreams was a victory. And on the podium, she was still all smiles. It was a tough day for me, it's true. I wasn't 100% in my matches. I was lacking a bit, got penalised a lot and fell apart in the match that I lost. But I ended up winning a bronze, so it wasn't the worst day. I wanted the Olympic gold for a long time. It was my third Games, and I was super proud to have succeeded. And it's true that it's changed a lot. It's changed training because I have won everything now, so it's harder to train every day. I announced today that this was my last Paris Grand Slam and that the end of my career will come at the World Championships in Rio. It's a decision that's in the process of building little by little, but I think that's what's going to happen. And so, it was time for the main event. Over 100 kilograms. Where one man is king of the world. Teddy Riner is a French phenomenon. He is just 23 and has already won everything there is to win. Including more world titles than any other male judoka. Bercy is his stadium. He has won all of the last five Grand Slams here. And this is also where he won his fifth world title. As if fighting a six foot eight, 130 kilo man wasn't hard enough, any fighter looking to dethrone Renner in Paris has also to fight the combined will of 15,000 adoring fans. He took it easy in his elimination contests, with the highlight being a wonderful Uchimata against the latest Japanese challenger, Shinshinui. After his Olympic success, the French media circus around him is even more intense. And this was his celebration party, in his palace. And he was determined to give his fans something to cheer about. As he prepared backstage, he knew nothing is a foregone conclusion in judo. Especially when it comes to his opponent, Kim. He has now cemented himself as the best of the rest in the category. And he has what it takes to throw for hip -hop. As his semi-final opponent, Silva, found out. Could Kim somehow steal Renner's crown? Well, the crowd are going absolutely mental here, waiting for their hero, Teddy Renner, to come out. And there, the great Duyet of France, the two-time Olympic champion, Teddy Renner has taken over his mantle, and my goodness me, he's only 23 years of age, and he's won everything. And here he is again in the final of Paris. And now he's got the grip over the top, and he's got the sleeve, and that's what he wants. And now Kim's got to get out of there. He can't just stay there. 
And the uh, president of the IJF, Mr. Marius Visa, looks no. on. She now goes to Kim. Kim now got to come forward. Nice as she was there from Kim. So Kim, certainly the best of the rest, that's for sure. But can he offer a real threat to this man? He's looking for the grip, driving Teddy Renair backwards. Renair takes a look at his coach. Renair does well there, shows his gymnastic ability to avoid that Ashiwaza. And uh, Jean-Luc Rouget, former world champion, 1975, he was world light heavyweight champion for France. And Kim really trying his best to uh, come over the top and to bring Renair's head down. Renair's not having any of it, but Kim is in there and he's fighting hard. Six foot eight, Teddy Renair, and uh, he's got great range of movement with that big right arm that he sends over, but sometimes he likes that sleeve first. Now he's got the sleeve, now the arm comes over. Now he's gonna try and pull that head down. And he looks, oh, now what's gonna happen? Oh, it's Uchimata! It's the biggest Uchimata you've ever seen. And the crowd here at Percy absolutely erupt. And Teddy Renair says, louder, please. 15,000 people are just on their feet for Teddy Renair. And he just did a little flick with the leg, first of all, set the uh, line up, and then he disappeared underneath him, and he just went right the way through with the Uchimata. Look at the back leg, look how deep he goes, look at the elevation he gets, and Teddy Renair has shown why he is king of judo. And it's just the biggest Uchimata. Look at the elevation. And I can tell you that Kim is no lightweight. And the lift that he got with that Uchimata was magnificent. He's just won his sixth Paris tournament. And, well, who can deny him winning his sixth world title later this year? There's no man capable, I don't think, of beating him at the moment. There he is in amongst his crowd, his adoring fans. And you've got to say, is he the best of all time? Because he's certainly heading that way. And Teddy Renair is not only the star of judo, he is the star of France. This was my first tournament back. It gave me a chance to judge my condition and my selection of techniques. I wasn't on great form, but there you are. I'll work to get better. And that's the important thing for the future, to just keep getting better. Uchimata is a technique that I've worked hard on. So yeah, I'm very happy to have won with it in the final. Now it's a card up my sleeve. It's important in order to create surprise to keep finding new techniques. For me, the challenge is to keep going until Rio 2016 and win as many medals as I can, to get on podiums in as many tournaments as possible and collect a lot of medals. That's it from Paris. Tucato made it to number one. But Laros became a two-time Paris champion. Javier got a revenge on Yamamoto. But the cost had to be content with a bronze. Renair showed why he is the king. And once again, did the roof off Percy Stadium. Join us next from Germany in two weeks' time for the 2013 Dusseldorf Grand Prix.